Good evening, everyone. Hello, how are you? Um, apologies for the late start. Um, I'm here just to do something very simple to introduce Professor Tabarno Young and Dr. Martin Krishna. And um, they're going to, Professor Tabarno Young is our keynote today. But I'd like to start by thanking the Center for African Culture um, Excellence for hosting this, the third, or no. This is the sixth edition of Writing for Women. I'm putting together what I hope is going to be, and I think is going to be, um, a stimulating and amazing festival. This is my first time at Write to Visit, and I already am enjoying. I've bought three t shirts and I'm buying more. And so please support them. And I just want to say it's an honor and a pleasure and a privilege, and also I'm really humbled that I was asked to introduce um, the keynote, Professor Taban Lolyong. Professor Taban is an academic, an author, and a translator. Um, and this morning over breakfast, he mentioned in passing that he was a deputy minister of something. So <laughs> that as well. Um, so he, uh, but, and more especially for us on the region, in the region, he is one of the pioneers of East African writing and scholarship. And together with Henry Ward Anyunga and Rudi Wathiongo, he has authored an essay on the abolition of the English department, which redefined the literary landscape in East Africa and created a legacy for literature departments in this region. Um, his essay, Can We Correct Literary Baroness in East Africa, which he probably is going to comment about now, but which most of us who do lit up East African literary studies keep going back to, was first published in Transition in 1965, and later in his collection of literary criticism, The Last Word. And it's one of the most controversial and debated essays in, on the, about in East Africa, especially in relation to um, when you look at East, West Africa and Southern Africa. And yes, even Dancy, who helped me write this, was still debating this yesterday. Professor Taban Leon is also a pioneering scholar in popular culture in East Africa, and this is one of the areas that I'm interested in as a scholar. And he edited a book in 1972, which could probably be the first of its kind in popular culture of East Africa. In addition, while many people seem to kind of dismiss Amos Tutola as the palm wine drinker, Professor Taban Lolyong was one of those first critics who had the perspective to look and understand and recognize what um, Tutola was doing at the time. And, and in, lately, there's been a kind of revisiting of that text. And uh, he wrote an essay called Tutola, Son of Zin. Zinza, I can't even say it. Sano? Yes, Sano of Zinzakyo Pax. What is that? You can maybe comment about that later. Um, but he's also a translator, and the translator of not. He translated um, or caught the little song of Lawino and into what and termed it the defense of Lawino. And one of the things that the defense of Lawino does, it offers us new ways of reading Song of Lawino. And one of what, why it offers us new ways is because what he did, and I think what is pioneering in that, is that he was able to include a chapter that Bitek himself did not translate. So I, one would have to buy the defense of Lawino, and it would be interesting to read it alongside Song of Lawino. Apart from the three books that I've mentioned, The Last Word, Popular Culture of East Africa, and The Fence of Lewino, his legacy spans four decades, in which he has, he has published more than 15 different kinds of um, pieces of work. These include Franz Fanon's uneven um, ribs, corpse lovers and corpse haters, so what, and so what, and so what. And so, in the spirit of writerism's um, thing, before JC's legacy, 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 there was Jennifer Nansu Makumbi skin to Before Makumbi, there was Moses Isegawa's Abyssinian Chronicles. Before Isegawa, there was and continues to be Professor Taban Mogillon. 
it is fitting that at this, the sixth edition of Vitalism, when we're celebrating the legacies that we have inherited, that we say take some time to consider our future legacies based on the discussions that we've been having before this and the, young, the, st the things that young people are doing on the continent, whether it's Libros, Wad Oven, Butale House, Heka, Bola, that's in Africa, we can see that these legacies that we're starting to create are going to be great for our future. So I'd like you, ladies and gentlemen, please would you join me in welcoming one of East African's legends, Professor Teta. Ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for the late coming. I also thank you all for your patience for waiting. Uh, but as somebody said, uh, better late than never. Especially since I outworked a young man at my age, my young age of 82, I outworked him. And uh, so I give myself credit for having kept myself young up to now, so that today I can come and see you even late as it is. Uh, there is nobody who is controversial except the person who somehow or other thinks that things which people think should not be talked about should actually be talked about. That is when controversy begins. So today, you might find that I am causing some more controversial questions about literature. The topic for today is called Joe Bones and Umbilical Court. Some of you must have met this thing in before, but some may not have. And today, I would like for you to find out how controversial this talk is. <coughs> it goes like this. Joe Bones and Umbilical Court the whole of the edition on Ugandan literature. The Baganda buried their kings in conical pyramids, built of wood and thatched with the grass. They don't actually bury the kings here. Only the lower jaws, jaw bones, and the umbilical cords. The whole body is buried elsewhere and never memorialized. The umbilical cord has been, taken, has been kept by the king's uncle since birth. Jaw bones are durable parts of the human, the animal body. It is, if it weren't for jaw bones, some archaeological finds would not have been made. So it is fitting that these archaeological pieces be preserved. How else? would the Baganda have kept their history if it were not by counting the jaw bones. Uh, I think there's even a chief in charge of jaw bones of the royalties. <laughs> On the human head, it is the jaw bones that move when we are eating or speaking. The jaw bones therefore represent speech. The king, the dead kings do speak as ghosts. They are concerted through the jaw bones. Buganda speech is long because there are many kings' jaw bones. Buganda words, as transcribed by the missionaries, make the words long, very, very long. The jaw bones of the past rule the mouth of the people of the present. The umbilical cord joined the fetus to the mother. How can it be discarded till one dies? How can one have one's most important link with the life thrown away? Indeed, how can one lose touch 
with the one's mother or mother earth. How can one be great with the reality? The Baganda history that most people know is the history of kings, jaw bones, and beautiful courts, the life exploits of the gallery of jaw owners, the aristocrats. Hence, Buganda history is lopsided. Jaws are small compared to the whole human head, the whole society. And of course, it is only the jaw bones of the Kabaka, uh, Kabakas which is kept. And therefore, the ordinary person's jaw bones really uh, are not taken care of, including the history of the ordinary person. As with the Baganda, so with the whole human head, so with the Banyoro, the Basoga, and the Northerners, Easterners, Westerners. In other words, it is not the total Buganda history that you study when you study the history of the kingdom. One needs very powerful jaw bones to be able to chew up other rival jaw bones. Hence, the kings were despotic. King Kintu was despotic. All the other kings that followed him were despotic. The British had to be more despotic to put them down. Obote had to drive the last king to England together with his jaw bones. The curse from those jaw bones drove Obote from the throne also. Amin's jaw bones cluttered out and he also continued the despotism. The past will continue. But should it? Most writings about Uganda are from foreign jaw bones, <laughs> criticizing and describing native jaw, big jaw bones. Or native small jaws, but small jaws, praising big jaws. Rarely too, small jaws, railing at big jaws. You cannot find a major work of art critical of jaw bones with uh, while they are on the throne. Most jaw bones praise the big bones. There is no major creative writing of Milton or Porter's jaws, apart from Robert Sermaga's such swipes. Only the Kabaka's big jaws criticized, or Porter's big jaws. There is uh, no major creative writing of E.D. and Mills big jaws by Ugandan small jaws. Robert Sermaga and Van Sirimu had uh, such swipes, but no frontal confrontations. Henry Chamber commented on the big G. Davis jaw bones the way other court historians have done before. Only foreign jaw bones collect the most uh, because the crown head belongs to the anointed being. The big jaws, jaw bones are powerful and sacred. Since you don't know how long their umbilical cord is, you don't dare open your jaws too loud against them. You might get lassoed. African artists on the whole are very respectful of the anointed big jaws. If they can't be their praise singers, they would prefer to close their mandibles or praise former big jaw bones whose evil deeds have been whitewashed by history. No reigning African president has been exhaustively criticized in a major creative work of art by one of his subjects. According to tradition, North African belief, a woman conceives during her menstrual period. And indeed, have you found a woman who is past menstruation, who can conceive? Menstruation is a sign of fertility. Even a 13-year-old, when she has a commenced menstruation, is right for marriage. The big Nyanza is extremely fertile, eternal, and confidence-inspiring. It menstruates all the time. It gives birth all the time. It has offspring as many as Queen Victoria, to whom it was compared. 
how can the propaganda feed insecurity when their lake stands unperturbed? Come what may. Whoever comes to disturb the peace of the propaganda gets overawed by the fecundity of Lake Victoria and remains mesmerized by the fertile liquid issuing from through the river Nile. Whatever her suitors do against her and her children ends up in enriching the kingdom. The lake provides the vapor which forms into rain. Every day there is rain, the soil is water, the grass grows abundantly. There is the banana grass for food and drink. There is the reed grass for building houses and fences. There is uh, the sugar cane for quenching thirst. There is the sweet potatoes for food. There is the ketubah tree for making back cloth. There is the coffee plant for berries. The animals feed on the grass and they multiply in abundance. The lake and its industry gives them fish. Um, fortunately, of course, uh, days have become bad and big fishes use their big jaw bones for feeding, for eating up small fishes in the lake. So there is danger ahead. We can, who can ignore the beautiful girl, this lady of the lake? We are trying to create a legend about a lady in the lake, this jewel of Africa. This sphinx, whose, daughters, whose daughter was she? We don't even know the autochthonous Ugandans or who the first human beings were in Uganda. Not the first naked shooters to this lady of the lake before Joe G, Big Joe Kindu came here. The land was already settled. The Bakopi and Bataka were already there, or there with their bananas and Joe bones, their size. Uganda has received wave after wave of naked suitors. They came with light moths to the fire. After they gratified their lust, they were chewed up by the queen's jaw bones, which were also uh, preserved in pyramids, chewed and digested. Some came in hopes and were swallowed up. Other single-minded adventurers came with the bands of fighters, priests, musicians, they came and superimposed uh, themselves on the peasants and stayed to eat Madoke. Others came, were rejected by the lady of the lake, stayed for a while, prattling their lines on the stage and were soon on their way, going to the underworld, going to the southern lands. Strangers have come and gone. Strangers have come and lost their identities. People have developed big bones, big joke of jokes. There are big joke temples all over the land. Who cares about upstarts? The banana grows whether Kindu is there or not. The banana grows whether Obote is there or not. The banana does not lose its fertility if a meal is around or gone. So why should the peasants worry? Or Obote returns or an Okelo or two, or in seven. Let those with the big jaws, or strong gold jaws, or those who are pretenders to this, have their word contest on the hilltops. The banana and the peasants still grow in the valleys, protected by the lady of the lake. The people lived in simple huts, made of grass, reed, and poles. The men built the, the hut. The people's women tilled the land, planted the matoke, cooked it for their men. The land is a female. Only another female knows her best. The people and the slaves ate bananas, potatoes. The people smoked tobacco. The people drank by marwa. The people gave birth and rejoiced. The people sang and the people drank. The people gave birth of yes, yes. The people sang and danced. The people wore back clothes. Their women walked naked, revealing their fertility, fertility and fecundity. So why, why? The people worshiped the gods of the clan, the Dubai. The people knew their death, death became ghosts, became uh, spirit. 
with hunger in their berries and anger in their bites. But the people also had priests, female priests, to intercede on their behalf. The people wore fetishes to protect themselves from all evils. The people had no cancer or stomach cancer. The people were safe and healthy. Then the misfits from other cultures came and disturbed the people. The people were rearranged into administrative units by King Jew, paid taxes, and otherwise cared less. The Pachesi came and drove King Jew's issues from the throne. The people were not prepared. The Pachesi had a hard time producing three generations of kings and disappeared south. The people lived and Chimera returned from Bunyoro. The people continued living. The princes fought. The queen mothers poisoned some. Bigger palaces were built. Reed fences were built by the power of the people's arms. New gods and fetishes were brought by the misfits. But the people also continued worshipping their body and ancestor fit and their ancestral ghost. The kings lived and died. The big dojos have the big, biggest have bigger temples built to preserve them. The people lived and multiplied. For the people are many, and the lady of the lake protects them. So why should the people worry? If they are poor in high places, what peasant's business is it? If the king had syphilis, which peasant went to spread the news? If the king fats in the palace, can the peasant smell it in far away valleys, in his far away valleys hat? If the king, if the chief or king wants to be praised, who would refuse such a chance for feasting? If the king did not want to be praised, who would lose his matoke and uh, be able? So, so long live the king up there on his hill. Meanwhile, the people have lived and multiplied in the valley. The people are many and they cannot get lost like the kings. The Arabs came, leaving their Zanzibar and Oman behind. They brought syphilis, guns, calico. The kings in their palaces caught the disease got the guns, wore it, and wore the, brought the chemical. That was their shawuri. The people didn't care. The people didn't care. The people uh, didn't care. Uh, the people opened the great gates. The visitors, visitors went in. The gates were closed. What went on inside uh, there mattered only to the king. Christian missionaries came all the way from their faraway queen. The missionaries saw the kings, but also talked to the people. The missionaries wooed the people. The missionaries found Katunda, a Muganda god, and named him God. The peoples pray also to Katunda, uh, now one of the gods, uh, and now also considered a Muganda god. The people knew uh, the Muganda. The lady of the lake was seduced permanently seduced. At long last, a change had come for the people. The missionaries brought the first shepherd left in the country. They pitted the people against the kings. The kings now wanted to return to Rubare, but it was all late now. After one generation of Christianity, Christianity is now beginning to lose hold. These people who are misfits in their own societies went to create my contents in Uganda. That what was socially good before the, became made bad. The British government went to protect my contents. That means dissatisfied. The people were happy and their king he to live on the hills. Long live the queen in England. The queen a jealous rival to the parts of the hearts of the people, that the queen in England root no root no competition from the lady of the day. The lady is now changed. She now menstruates through electric sluices. Big jaw fishes, as we said already, are chewing up 
the smaller fishes just as the main uh, was chewing a favorite meal. The lady of the lake gave voices to her people. She strengthened the jokes of the people of the body. And after a period of one other life, the people of Queen Victoria also disappeared like other prettlers on the throne before them. Yet, there is not even a single artistic creation condemning the reign of the British. Oh, God, the, widow, the daughter of the lake, sings a plea in honor of her misused mother. But she, or oh, she, she's only a woman. Perhaps then it is the women's time. For the people's creativity is different. The people do not write books. The people sing most of the time. The people's memory is long. The people remember past dark days, which were overtaken by sunny days. The people live, in a, in, live a full life without worrying about criticizing the masters. For the masters are far away on the hills. For the masters are always grumbling over bones and meat from the palace. For the masters are always resident for the best seats. What concern of the people is it whoever sits on the throne scheme? The people know they will always pay taxes. The masters must have only how to exchange clever words for a good food, uh, amount of food and power at court. But the people's ranks are being depleted. Queen Victoria's boys seduced their children. The Kaumpuri, the plague of the Bukamania, the good and bad disease has spread. Now the old people stay at home worshiping Rubare. The children are off to school mastering printed material. They are so busy mastering the ADC that they don't know yet, that we don't even know yet what uh, would be good and what would be bad. They are still at a loss on whether uh, to use the virus stick to measure the present day or the stick which Queen Victoria's people brought. Uh, these of Lubare are now being judged by measures from outside. The truth tellers among the BBC, as we say, uh, born before computer, receive scant attention. They are not regarded as important people by the dot com generation. They are also still so busy learning new language practicing their jokes for singing new songs that the songs can yet even be sung. But lots of generations are busy taking at their personal gods in their different rooms. It is not a communal thing. Ugandans are so disdainful of death that they don't cry. <coughs> Kings are mourned by formula. Life is so big that this is but a small matter. The start of the journey to the land of ghosts, apart from apart from Queen Victoria and Gutenberg's boys, who are acquiring new formula for measuring life, most Ugandans dance of death or the death uh, tomorrow, carving not caring nothing about the day. Uganda has always been a land of heroes. Heroes distinguish themselves in wars. Whoever falls on the battlefield is a hero still though they, the musicians have always sung songs of heroic deeds. The compass of a man against his fellow man, regardless of the ground for the conflict, uh, or if he should participate in it. It is not only Ugandans who are singing praises uh, all the time, but everybody else. After Queen Victoria's children have been to their place, has been doing that. When a war started, one always supported the fighters from one's home. Sometimes Kutenba's boys rail against nepotism or tribalism, but they do this to criticize the participants from another tribe. It is not general rule. 
life is lived together, to enjoy together. Death is mourned together. Now that Amin is gone, we should expect very courageous denunciation of the man and his deed, especially from those who benefited from him. Otherwise, we have to wait till 1984. This was written long time ago, before we have a modern novel from Uganda, a novel which treats of current affairs rather than the tribal histories or individual <coughs> autobiographies or general history politics. Who can never tell a spade, quotes a spade, a spade to his spade. Most Ugandan writers are skeptical of the value and use of Western education. Of the Western education they got. Of course, the women <coughs> thinks it is a miseducation, if not outright subversion. Ukeros often and the prostitute are not happy with the civilizing, and we get that word the civilizing effects of education. These writers would be happier serving the gods Lubare and promoting the interest of the lady of the lady. These two writers want to remain with the people, to be the people's spokesman, the people's composite job bonds. Uh, they have turned their backs on the whole essence of missionary education. Maybe if two of them had their job ones together, the job ones could be big. But the evil servants, the civil servants are against them. The technocrats are against them, for the technocrats have lost the voice of the people and were taught in no school the formula for serving the lady of the lake. They were first employed, employees of the white men, and uh, then they had their testicles crushed by the big books in the universities. The kings and the chiefs and musicians, singers and dancers, sometimes there were wrestling matches. They also had oral tale reconciles in the village. Some of these dramatized parts of the tales, some of them sang parts of the tale, some of the tales of the people's history. But the tales were light entertainment. When the missionaries came and opened schools, they introduced the idea of concert of, for Saturday night's entertainment. For Saturday night's entertainment. Uh, these were always light comedy for entertainment, laughter and to be funny. That is how entertainment is viewed. That is how drama is viewed in the African context how a diversion from serious matters of state is viewed. This is also how the people of the writer of Pramatist is viewed. Not an interrogator, not a questioner, not a critic, especially not a critic. The generation of people before the serious matters of state attack uh, is the entertainment before the serious matters of state are tackled. The king had his chiefs to discuss serious matters of state. The chiefs also had uh, their, their advisors. Serious matters of state are discussed in courts by experienced, durable elders. You don't send storytellers there. You cannot have an independent platform to air your views there, right reason or not. So, writing literature as independent criticism of, of societies, all the political realm is new. The books are taught very seriously. Factual book textbooks, that is, materials on religion, sociology, economics, politics of Uganda, are all memorized as the truth. But the truth in novels, in poetry, in short story, or drama, or song, are regarded as diversions. Only seers have the right to exercise their madness and say their bitter things. If there were problems, the king's orders consulted the gods and his ancestors, Joe Bones. If they needed human advice, his chiefs were there. The writer, as an independent critic of society, is a new creation. He had no role in the order of things. 
what we have seen so far are tribal writers and dramatists. Robert Serumaga's novel was written by him as a Mugandan criticizing Obote the Lama. His plays have always had a Muganda based critical of the non baganda regime. He uh, not yet evolved into a pan Ugandan artist. So the gods of the tribe are still firmly in control of their children. Only Okwak had gone further. He is in the happy state of counting amongst his parents an Acholi, which is an erotic, and a Chope, which is a Bantu, or a half Bantu. So he had parents from both sides, and therefore he had to leave the truth of uh, his birth. And he grew up in the white household. He was born in a white woman's house. Perhaps at the end of a minister, perhaps during a minister of tribal, tribal Ugandans might have been brought together into Ugandan, in the United Uganda. We don't know yet. This was when the, this thing was written. But the people came together for hatred of a me, not for the love of one another. When he wrote Song of the Prisoner, that is uh, my friend who got, he should have not dared to write again another book called The Song of the Soldier. Because the soldier was also the killer of his own relatives. <coughs> But how can young writers write very well in the absence of comprehensive philosophical framework? How can young writers write very well in the absence of comprehensive philosophical framework? Capitalism will continue the individual greed and tribalism, tribal nepotism, tribal defense of tribal wrongs, tribal traditions as basis for writing will still keep people apart and recall the bitter days of tribal fights and feuds. Maybe only socialism could produce the best umbrella under which Ugandans could see themselves as one group. But again, socialism in black uh, Anglophone Africa has never produced literary adherence. Uh, so what could, be, could we expect from Ugandan friends from now onwards? Poems condemning the past rulers, yes. Stories also, yes. Novels about the plight of the people during the means time, praise, recover, recover in the same period, yes. Praise of the liberation group, liberation group, yes. And then we, the people, are made to escort them to the palace. And then they are told to go back to the village. The criticism of the new leaders, Criticism of the new leaders after we have taken them into palace? No. The day a Ugandan writer will take a larger view of modern life and circumscribe the perimeter of the just and the unjust, the day a Ugandan writer will do what Sembele Osmane had done in Senegal will be the day Ugandan literature has come for age. But such a person we need very strong jaws and very long umbilical cords. I think let me leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh. Well, first, I just want to say thank you, Professor, for that wonderful address which was incisive, but also filled with wit and humor. I think we all could follow the metaphor. And I guess I wanted to start by asking you, in the time since you first wrote this piece, has the situation changed? Have we seen the emergence of a writer as a critic or a people spokesman? Or do writers continue to be praise singers? Do they continue to capitulate to the big job bones? Uh, we have been waiting for the emergence of such a person, and such a person came, Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer, <laughs> that person, Jennifer defied all the rules. 
traditionally we had been expecting greater things to come from Makerere than later when John Bobo. Jennifer went uh, to a university in the East and a Muslim university as such. And then you know, I don't know where they got that for the teachers of literature to teach her in such a wonderful way of looking at life. And Jennifer also did something which is very, very good. Jennifer criticized Baganda royalty for disregarding respect for their culture. And see, Jennifer was saying that we, the Baganda, deserve what we are doing because we have disregarded our culture and therefore we should shut up and more or less live the way that we have left to take roots in our land. I think that is a very, very important statement because that book of hers, that message there is, look, you, Baganda, you have such and such and such and such a culture, how come you have disregarded it? And others are planted there in its place. Uh, so if there has been a rescue, I would say uh, Jennifer Makumbi has done it. And I like it also because this time it is not a man singing the song of a woman, <laughs> it is a woman singing the song for the nation. Yeah. That's very true. Yeah. But it's interesting because that novel very nearly wasn't published. It was rejected over and over and over again. So even with Jennifer, it was such a struggle for it to come. And I guess what I'm wondering is what the fact that we've had to wait until 2014 for Jennifer, what does that say about the landscape of literature in East Africa today? Is it still barren? Do we see fecundity now? Well, one of my worries is this, that this this was written in 1979. So if between then and now, it is only Jennifer who has come up, then that says a lot. That says it all. Yeah, that says it all. For 40 years, only Jennifer came. What happened to the others? Is it a matter of small joke bones? <laughs> But you know, why is that? Why is there this tendency of the writer to be afraid to criticize? Uh, I think, again, my little his knowledge of uh, Baganda, Banyoro, Batoro, and so on, the, king, the royal kingdoms, is that the people are divided up into clans. And therefore, a clan leader must supervise what his people do and therefore to break out of that is difficult. That is why it is difficult to have a revolution in Uganda or in the king, king's areas. Because before you can do it, the Kabaka will have to be removed, will have to be informed about what is happening. And then the Kabaka will rebuke the king or the, the chief. He, it doesn't matter whether he comes from uh, uh, a smaller kingdom or a smaller, a smaller uh, clan or not. Since everything has to go through the clan head, it was difficult for individuals to start doing what they want to do. That is why the most rulers of Uganda have been naked rulers from outside Uganda. So one of the things amongst the many, many things that you are famous for was the abolition of the English department, uh, the call to change the English department to the Department of Literature, to recenter Africa in education in Africa. And you know, now many decades have passed since that piece was written. What has its legacy been? Uh, we were, so to speak, the people who were laying down the rules, who had seen what was wrong. Mm -hmm. But we did not live long enough to ensure that our revolution 
was adopted by those who were te teaching us. This thing was only done in my Nairobi University. And in the Nairobi University of those days, there were only two of us who were teaching in the Department of Literature, Ngugi and myself. And then the new teaching assistants who are coming, all their teaching positions to the Queen's children. We had one South African, we had one uh, South African white, we had one uh, Malawi white, uh, then we had uh, a Welsh, and then we had uh, one or two uh, Scotsmen, and so on and so forth. So there were only two of us, and we are also busy writing our own things. Unfortunately, I uh, left, and uh, Gubi, uh, who always uh, wanted a revolutionary solution to problem, uh, was having these wars with the administration of the university and of the country. So there was really nobody to stay the course. Mm -hmm. That is what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did not have disciples. Mm -hmm. So it was likely to that. You are known as being very unafraid of criticizing systems that many people are afraid to criticize, you know, whether it's the government, whether it's the education system, whether it's literature and writing itself. And I guess I was wondering for you, how do you see these things being connected? Your, your critical take on education versus your critical take on the literary landscape, but also your own creative practice. Uh, I think, first, I grew up in a Chori land, and the Chori were not uh, happy with the British, and they were not happy with their neighbors, and so on and so forth. They were, so to speak, very critical of other people. Uh, that is number one. Uh, number two, I think, uh, I one of the people uh, since we came from the that uh, some South Sudan and I was staying in the palace uh, but more or less because I uh, dependent uh, I, uh, I did not like my status uh, so if I get criticized that I have that with me then what else can I fear? <laughs> So we have time for questions from the audience. If you have a question that you would like to ask the professor, please raise your hand. We have a microphone going around. If you could wait for the microphone to come to you so we can all hear. Do we have any questions from the audience? My name is Susan Chibri from Makere. Um, I'm so glad to hear from you again, our father directly my father. I would like to ask just this simple question. Why did you decide when you were writing that piece to use such heavy symbolism, meat and history? As a matter of fact, what happened was this. That all of us outside there had hope Uganda was going to give leadership to Uganda. We don't know how to lost the spirit. <laughs> First, my understanding is, at independence time, there was Kapagayeka, and Kapagayeka was there. In Kapagayeka, there was Anachori, my future brother-in-law, Dan Uchen. And when the 1962 election was coming, uh, the Kabaka, friend of Uchen, asked Uchen to be in attendance when uh, Ben Kiwanoka was called to the palace and said, Ben, this thing is coming. If you are uh, uh, BP and my Kabaka Yaka team together, we can defeat Obote. So can you please uh, accept uh, this merger? Ben said, yes, I will accept. Then Ben came standing 
and the Kafana say, well, you and Uganda, you know, you don't receive anything from the Palestinian camp. Why don't you leave them? And when you want to refuse to leave them, you say that you can Catholic, you can't leave them before it's very human being, and so on and so forth. So that brother, asking Christ of Christ, you know what you are giving away? And we refuse to lay down. I think the Pope was happy, the Roman Catholics in Rubaga, they are like it, and so on and so forth. The next day, Uchein went and called Obote, and Obote was asked whether UPC and Kabaka Yeka could join together. And Obote said yes. Said okay, and lay down and get it. So Obote knelt down and received the murder. That is how uh, Ben Tiwanuka lost the rulership of Uganda from Uganda to the Lanuman. If, if, if uh, Ben Tiwanuka had accepted and asked for forgiveness from God, it would have been done. But he said, I don't do it, I don't need that before you and me. So those of you who are Catholic, blame you are too much belief. In the, the belief that came from outside. Yeah? So, the Ben Wanoka had become non Buganda by so doing. So, you lost it. You don't know what the history of Uganda was going to be if Ben Kiwanoka had accepted the ruler. So, we lost it. The Catholic lost it and they never got it back. So, we may need a um, Muganda Catholic who is not a hundred percent or fifty percent Catholic, but who is also a believer in Lubara. So that is that. We expected much from Baganda. We did not only expect much. This thing that uh, Jennifer has done is what we are waiting for. Where when will the Muganda, the Royal Muganda, come? and show leadership in intellectual matters, in creative writing. And Jennifer has rescued it. So we have been waiting, waiting, waiting. And then I'm glad that Jennifer took it up on her shoulders, a woman's shoulder. Uh, that I, I like it. Uh, so we love and love Uganda, the Uganda and so on and so forth. But as I say, people have been coming from outside naked and getting dressed in Uganda. Yeah? And then the Uganda say, oh, Bakubi, Bakubi, Bakubi. My father came and worked in Europe, and it was one of the Nyabwanga, they were called Nyabwanga, I don't know what Nyabwanga means, right? So that is what happened. People came here to learn to do this, a lot of people learn to Uganda to such a big way that my brother, that he was as good a Muganda speaker as anybody. Uh, that was why he was like a brother's brother. So those were the things. Uh, even up to now, I'm still waiting for more Baganda intellectuals, academicians, and inventors and discoverers to come and give Uganda their leadership. It is like you go to Kenya, the white people for whom too much money was being sent for education. They are not there teaching. No white man who is the son of the settler is a professor in any university in the world. So what has happened? Why too much money was spent on those people? All right? So where all the settlers, settlers children have become killers and then two are directors. <laughs> so that is that. Uh, and then you, the Baganda, have let us down by not taking up the role of leadership, which was supposed to have been yours. Other questions from the audience? My name is Irene Tishabe. I'm not a Muganda, but I have a question about when you, made, when you, when you said something about Jennifer McCombe being the only one who's written something critical that 
you find worthy of respect. Um, I respect her too, I love the book. Uh, but I wondered, is it because hers is a novel and haven't you found any short fiction or short creative nonfiction that stands up to her documents as a novel? That's also critical, critical of the powers that be, or is it a particular kind of criticism that? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I would say that Jennifer has mastered the art of creative writing, writing of long narratives, writing of the novel, the modern novel. That is the first difference, that most of us are still writing in the guise of uh, something which happened to us yesterday after the party and so on and so forth. But uh, this one, she was writing towards the purpose. So people have not been reading. Those who have not come to terms with the modern uh, creative writing, especially of fiction, may not understand where she's coming from and where she's going. But I'm trying to say that I also notice that she has mastered the new art of creative writing and put it to good effect. She had the, the form which she used in order to tell the tale. And then, of course, from where she came from, from a, a Muslim university, mm -hmm. uh, one gets surprised. How did she do it from there? And then, uh, my daughter here, uh, who should still write more writing poetry, because she is the best speaker of English. So why does my daughter tell me to tell fellow Ugandan, I have been in England, I know how the name is pronounced, but I am going to write these poems, and these poems I am going to write, I am going to write sonnets, and the sonnets are going to follow all the rules of sonnet writing, and so on and so forth. Because we are, it is a, an Islam art. So you don't have to be an English person to write sonnets. The English people uh, have a ticket from Italy. So they made it their own. So why don't you do it in Luganda? Unfortunately, Luganda language is very long. Words, the words in Luganda are not few. Yes, and so one line can actually form a whole line in one word. <laughs> okay, so I'm trying to say, I an artist is an artist. You can bring to life new things. You don't have to be this and that. You can do something else. Okay. I think there's somebody there. Yes, there's behind it. And then you can send it to Yes, yes. and then there's behind it. I am called Osio Dennis. I am from Uganda Reading, and I work with Apple TV. I am a, a very passionate youth. I think of men of us here. Who is passionate about writing? Uh, we, we wish to have uh, those big jobs that you are talking about, read about systems and the way how things are going. But the terrain that we are living in like these days is uh, not accommodating for us. I can give you an experience as a journalist. In our newsroom there, uh, you bring a story before actually a your story that you have worked on, even uh, done research about. But your editor will tell you, please remove this and do this. Because it's not favorable, it's going to, it's going to tell you that it's going to bring some things to us. Now, I don't know the, how you guys lived in those days. <laughs> because if you had guys to write about the key, like that, right now we don't have, we, we don't enjoy that one thing. What should we do? First of all, uh, rights are not given. You know, we are not given rights. You are not given rights. You fight for your rights. So, uh, create a room. If the room is too small, you enlarge it. You enlarge it, enlarge it, enlarge it. By making sure that you start little, small, small. And when it is accepted, you extend it like the Arab 
who wanted to get into a tent say, okay, you know, uh, man, um, my ears are sensitive to rain. Can I push my head in? And he says, you can put your head in. Then he says, my hump also is giving problem. Can you let me in? And so on. Uh, what about my back? He says, okay, that, that, that room is not enough. I say, okay, if it is not enough, you get out. So that is how uh, rights can be got. So you don't ask to say, okay, we need this thing given. Uh, but again, in our time, or put it another way, Ngugi, my friend, has already shown uh, that courage mm -hmm. that lands him in jail. So why do you think that some of you should not be jailed? <laughs> I think we can go to the next question. If, 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 if the only way, if the only way to start enlarging that space, then why do you think that some of you should not be in uh, that? And then if they are taken there, you take them water, you take them food, you take them porridge, and so on and so forth. Be go there in big number so that uh, they can see that this guy is not alone. So if you, you act alone, that is the fate of the hero who wants to act, act alone. Don't be selfish so that you want to do things on the own. Um, thank you, Professor. My name is Danson Kahiana. Uh, I have two questions. Number one, you've written more than 22 books. Of these books, which one do you consider the big job? <laughs> Uh, they all have jewels. <laughs> and number two. Um, wait, 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 wait. Wait, I would like to say one thing again. A, we who published did not publish because anybody liked our books. The colonial days were going, and the politicians with their big jewels were talking too much and then the colonial, the Queen's people, were trying to find out what do the other people think about the situation in their land. And somebody said, look, go and he, overhear it. Let the writers write their short stories, their novels, their plays, and so on and so forth. They may actually show us how the, uh, the umbilicals, umbilical court, or the sting of their kings, where it is hidden, so that we can pull it out. Mm -hmm. So after a while, it is like, I'm sorry if there's an Indian here, but in Kenya, in Kenya there was a problem. In Kenya there was a problem. At independence, at independence. Some of the Kenyan, some of the Indians who were big people, as well as my merchants and the politicians who invite one of the politicians come home for supper and he would come home to the Indian home. Then the Indian would have a, a girl. Uh, said, uh, well, uh, you, the story you've been hearing was wrong. It is not that uh, our women don't speak to you, uh, but uh, today you can share a hard bed with the, with the, with the bed with the, that uh, Indian girl there. <laughs> but after a while, they find that you don't have to give your sister or to some Indian prostitute to an African president. If you gave them a bottle of whiskey, that will do the work. <laughs> yeah, so then they stopped publishing us when they knew that uh, the African politicians can be uh, corrupted easily without you are publishing their writers. So we were left out in the cold. And then some of the books, uh, uh, like uh, Heinemann, started selling Heinemann to uh, a West African who was working in uh, Liberia. So a uh, rubber plantation owner bought that up and later when another person bought it up and so on and so forth, he, he didn't care anymore what the African writers were saying. So our books remained in England there. So some of you may never be able to get some of the books. Mm -hmm. That is number one. Number two, 
those of you who get books are not in the habit of reading books. <laughs> when I was in Nairobi, among my two, between my two friends, me, Robert, and Gumi, I was the only one who was reading Bukot and reading Bukot. Bukot never read a book, never read Bukot, Bukot never read Bukot, never read Bukot. <laughs> so, nobody read other people. And then, that is why there is no literary criticism of East African books. By now, the professor of literature in Nairobi should have been a Kenyan professor who got his PhD on the strength of Google's book mm. and who would be the authority, world authority, on the writings of Google, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, here, or in Guru University, or uh, in uh, Barara University, there could be a chair uh, in the university there for a quarter of a meter, and, uh, but nobody has read the work so that they can recommend it. So we need readers. It is not enough to say, I want to write, I want to write, I want to write, if there are no readers who are going to read it. So what's the use of our reading, of our writing? So what I do is a simple one. I'm going to lay traps for future East African, Ugandan, Ugandan. I write and write and write and write and say, okay, anybody who now in future would like to know what I've written, would have to start from there and come up to here. <laughs> so that is what I'm doing. It is a curse. I'm cursing you. <laughs> I'm not we have time for one or two more questions. Are there any people up, oh, Billy, in the front? That's in front, yeah. yeah. can we bring it to the front? Uh, the, oh, no, there's one at the back. Let's get in the back, Peter, and then we'll bring it to the front to Billy. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Kagai Ngomi, and I, I have two questions. Uh, one is that uh, it, it's following up on, on the argument that you made about you know the book, you know the books that you printed not being available, uh, you know to the readers even amongst themselves at the time. Uh, did you consider performance as an exception to that to that rule of publication? And question two is a question that I ask from the bottom of my heart as a, as okay, a poet. Okay, let me answer the first one first, which is which you and you ask from, from the bottom of, from the top of your head. <laughs> and uh, this is this. I have considered it, and I have written three plays. One in a jewelry called La Poromo Pendroot, which was published last year, and another one, uh, which is Mr. Show What and Mr. So What. And then uh, there is another one called uh, The Color of Love. Uh, those books are there. So I consider uh, that. But the question is do the people who are in charge of drama, do they really train their uh, dramatists? They give degrees for production of local products or not. You ask that to them. I've written the book. So if they've not produced it, it is not my problem. <laughs> okay. Ask the other one. Can I ask my second question? Yes. yes. Thank you. My second question is the question that I'm asking from the bottom of my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Why are we speaking English? Okay. Uh, luckily, Luckily, you know English, that is why I can understand you. <laughs> uh, because one thing, um, what happened in 1884-85 in Berlin has messed us up. And it is very difficult to fall the map back. It is extremely difficult. And uh, not only that, uh, we may wonder whether we are better off as we are or we are worse off. Uh, but then it is like saying, if others have been prosecuted before, how can we expect ourselves 
not to also be corrupted. Uh, uh, colonizing people did not start with the British and others on Africa because Jam uh, Greeks also had colonies in their time. And one of the Greeks, one of the Greeks who went to Cyrene and did something wrong there and was caught and imprisoned was uh, my friend Plato. Plato was imprisoned in Egypt for 10 years. When he finished, when he was released, when philosophers in Athens collected money, then they went and redeemed him. Then he came and wrote his uh, dialogues of uh, Socrates. Okay, and then uh, Cologne in Germany is a colony, a German colony of the Romans, and so on and so forth. So uh, things have changed, and therefore the question is, uh, are you better off in this form, or you wish you were in, in another form? Uh, we, when we were writing, and we knew that some of the printers, publishers of books, were agents of the colonial masters, agents of CIA, and so on and so forth, we say, okay, will they stop my views from being published? If he was not going to stop my views from published, I can use his, his medium for spreading what is in, my, in the bottom of my heart. So if he can let me use this thing to criticizing him, then I would do it. So uh, you tr uh, try to forget every English word you know, and uh, try to remember all the Kikui words you had forgotten, and let us see where you will end. And this, unfortunately, will have to be our last question because of time, but Billy? Thank you, Professor. My name is Billy Kahora from Kwani, Kenya. Um, in an interview you did with Chimurenga, uh, with editor Stacy Hardy, you said that when you, when you ended up at the University of Nairobi, uh, after coming from Iowa, the University of Iowa, and, and doing creative writing, you tried very much to push for the introduction of creative writing teaching at the University of Nairobi, and this never ever took uh, root. Uh, and you said in the interview that uh, you think that this would have injected a new energy into the writing of the time. I'm just curious about what you think at this point. Uh, if these comments, if, if I haven't misquoted you from this interview, if this had actually happened, do you think there will be a kind of different nature to East African literature today, literature today Kenyan literature? And what do you think uh, would have happened? Thank you. Uh, well, it, it didn't happen. Uh, that is a fact. And uh, unfortunately also, there would be writers never did what they wanted to do. In Zimbabwe, there was no class, no, no class for teaching creative writing. But it didn't stop Marechera from writing what he wrote. So the question is, uh, don't we have now the internet? Can you go learn creative writing from Google? In Africa, among the African writers, Cyprian Equency, the writer of uh, Jack Banana, he did learn how to write by correspondence courses. In Kenya, uh, Grace Ugot learned how to write by uh, doing it through creative writing whilst working uh, as a is somebody to book people for Kenya Airways. So what is the problem with those of you who can Google and who know the English? Rather, I want to put another question. What have you done with the English that you know? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we do have people who know IT, who know this and that, and they're doing that. So what are they doing? Are they reading jokes about uh, later, the political leaders? Is that all? Are you not wasting time running after silly criticisms in the 
iPad, in the Facebook, in the this and that, and so on. Do you want to tweet like Trump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm sure that some of you, anybody who wants to learn how to write can, and who knows how to use the, uh, the computer, can now do it and can practice. But what is the matter? Do you want to bring me here 10 years from now to tell you again that you have missed that you had the means for doing what other people have been doing, and, but that you didn't do it. Do you want to be told, why don't you go and seek ye the creative, the kingdom, <laughs> or the creativism, creativism kingdom, and then you can add other things to yourself. Thank you very much. So unfortunately, we are out of time. But I think we can all agree that it has been an honor to listen to the professor speak, to listen to his generous sharing of his wisdom, his experience, his own knowledge. It's not every day you get to share a room with someone whose legacy, which continues to grow, is so rich and so varied. So thank you all very much, and thank you, Professor. Hi. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, I wanted to say, if I'm stepping on this floor, I am assuming that I'm stepping on Mother Earth. And Mother Earth would not like people to come to her short wearing shoes. Mother Earth wished you came to her with your feet to touch her, to connect yourself to Mother Earth. So I'm calling this a hallowed area. And I'm saying that what I have said today is hallowed knowledge hallowed knowledge. So don't take it lightly. Whatever I've said, I meant them. Thank you very much.